please take your Bible this evening and go to John chapter 14, if you would please. John chapter 14. <clears throat> John 14. We're going to read the first six verses of John 14. Read them responsibly as we normally do, beginning together on verse 1, then I'll read 2 and we'll alternate till we end on verse number 6. And as our custom is, let's stand together to read the scripture, all of us standing to read God's word, and begin together on verse 1 of John 14. Ready? Let not your heart be troubled, ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions, if it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. (coughs) And whither I go ye know, and the way ye know. And Thomas saith unto him, Lord, we know not whither thou goest, and how can we know the way? And let's read six together also. And Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. And let's pray together. Father, add your blessing, please, to the reading of our scripture here tonight. Thank you, Lord, already for the wonderful service together this evening. Just the wonderful, wonderful music tonight, both congregationally and from the choir and Lord, the wonderful testimonies by the ladies who attended the conference. And Father, we're asking you now your blessing upon the special as it's sung this evening and that you'll continue to make our hearts good soil that the word of God will fall into and it'll bring forth fruit in our lives. Bless the music to that end now in Jesus' name. Amen. Why should I feel discouraged? Why should the shadows come? Why should my heart be lonely and long for heaven and home? When Jesus said, my poor son, my constant friend is he. His eye is on the sparrow, and I know he watches me. His eye is on the sparrow, and I know he watches me. Let not your heart be troubled, his tender word I hear, and resting on his goodness. I lose my doubts and fears, though by the path he leadeth, but one step I may see, his eye is on the sparrow, and I know he watches me. His eye is on the sparrow, and I know he watches me. Whenever I am tempted, whenever clouds arise, when songs give place, to sighing when hope within me dies I draw the closer to him from care he sets me free his eye is on the sparrow and I know he cares for me 
His eye is on the sparrow, and I know he cares for me. I sing because I'm happy. I sing because I'm free. For his eye is on the sparrow, and I know he watches me. Amen. Emily had played that for an offertory this morning, and I thought, man, I've been thinking about that song. Somebody ought to sing that. I think somebody just did. And uh, great job, Brother Bob. Thank you. Father, thank you for this evening now. Thank you, Lord, for, again, the, the good spirit that's in this place and for what you're doing in each one of our lives. <clears throat> we bow before you now as we come to Open up your word. Thank you for the Bible. Thank you, Lord, for giving us your words, preserving them for us. Lord, we don't believe them to be the words of men or the words of a man. We believe them to be in truth, the words of God. And so, Lord, open our eyes and open our understanding tonight as we look at this important truth, the truth from your word. Help me as I bring the message and help each individual as they listen. May your will be done in our lives. In Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> I'm bringing, I was speaking, uh, preaching out to prison at uh, Madison there on Friday morning and preaching on this subject, the truth. And as I was preaching that, and, and it just seemed like the Lord spoke to my heart that this is not just a truth for these guys to hear. Church needs to hear this. And, and it just uh, seemed like that's what the Lord uh, would have me to bring to you this evening truth. Jesus said here in John 14, 6, that I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. <clears throat> we, we often say in the RU ministry, and their, their motto is, their slogan is, only the truth makes free. And the truth is not something, the truth is someone. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And I know we talk about Jesus being the way. Yeah, there's not many ways to God. There's one way to God. And that is through Jesus Christ. He is the way. Not one of the many ways. Not a way. He is the way. If you're going to come to God, if you're going to get to heaven, if you're going to have eternal life, you'll have to come through Jesus Christ. That's it. You say, that's pretty narrow. Jesus said it'd be narrow. Okay? And uh, that's all right. Then he said he's the way. Uh, he's the way, the truth. He's the truth. And sometimes we get away from that. And by the way, as you get away from Jesus Christ, you get away from truth. And uh, Jesus is the truth. <clears throat> now, the, now uh, the society tells us, just as they tell us many, there's many ways to heaven, they'll tell us there's many different truths. Okay? Now, they're not truth. They're lies. And we're going to talk about some of them this evening. Uh, you see, there's one standard of truth, and that's Jesus Christ. Now, He is the living Word. The other standard of truth is the written Word of God. Uh, this is the truth of God. Uh, this is a standard by which we can go by. It boggles my mind that in a recent poll of Christians, not, not unbelievers, people who say they're believers, only 60% of them believe that there's absolute truth. It means 40% of the people who believe in Jesus Christ as their Savior doesn't believe there's absolute truth. Well now, does that mean they don't believe in Jesus Christ? And maybe they're not believing in the Jesus Christ of the Bible. Are they not believing in God's Word being absolute truth? But we, get, we can get brainwashed, we can get um, blinded, I guess, by society. We begin to, you know, if you hear a lie long enough and you say a lie long enough, you begin to think it's the truth. And, and there's five lies that society tells us, and 
it's not just society, it's Satan himself, and you'll see that here in a minute, that we have to compare to the truth. I'm glad we have a standard for truth. There has to be a standard of truth. And that standard is Jesus Christ. Now here's lie number one. Let me give you five of them this evening, and I won't keep you long. And I shouldn't say that. I don't want to keep you long. And, uh, uh, and, and I hope I won't. But lie number one. How we live our lives will not affect our relationship with a loving God. How we live our lives will not affect our relationship with a loving God. Look at 1 John chapter 1. Not John, Gospel of John, but 1 John chapter 1. It's towards the back of your Bible. You get to Revelation, the last book, you take a left, and you should come to Jude, then 3 John, 2 John, 1 John. 1 John 1, please. <clears throat> Notice with me verse number 6, where the Bible says, If we say that we have fellowship with Him and walk in darkness, we what? We, we what, church? And do not the truth. The truth. So we say we have fellowship, but we walk in darkness. Darkness is a lack of spiritual direction. Someone who walks in darkness walks without any spiritual direction from God. That's why the Bible talks about those who aren't saved. He calls them children of darkness. They have no spiritual direction from God. When we say we have fellowship with Him, but walking is taking repeated steps. So I say I have fellowship with God, but I take repeated steps in darkness, then I'm lying. Oh, me and the man upstairs. We, 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 we got things worked out. Well, unless you live in a bottom apartment, you're not talking about God, I hope. Oh, me and... Me and the me and the me me and God we, we have an arrangement. God doesn't make arrangements. Okay? If you say you have fellowship with him and you're taking repeated steps in darkness with a no spiritual direction at all, you're lying. Don't get mad at me. I'm just telling you what the book said. Isn't that what it said? Didn't you read what I read? We lie and we do not the truth. <clears throat> God desires obedience. He told Saul in the Old Testament to obey is better than sacrifice. And so he says in the book of Proverbs, a faithful man shall abound with blessings. How I live affects my relationship with God. You've heard me use the illustration before with my brother and myself. Growing up, as we got older and we had a family, my brother did not go live the way he should have lived. And did not want to, he wanted to do things that were wicked and sinful. And uh, he told my father he didn't even want to get together on family get-togethers. Don't invite him, don't call him. He just didn't care to be around the family. <clears throat> now I want to ask you a question. Was, was my brother still my dad's son? Sure. Still his son, but could, you know what, you know the hard part was? My dad could not be a father to him because he was unwilling to be around my father. Unwilling to be around my dad. Unwilling to forsake his sin to be around my father. Now, that's why the Bible says, if we come out from among them and be separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, God says, I'll receive you and I'll be a father unto you. Doesn't mean he isn't our father, but he can't be if he can't function as a father to us. When the prodigal son left home, he's still his son. But dad couldn't be a father to him because he wasn't there. Not till he came back home and submitted himself could he do the functions of a father. And so how I live, it don't I don't buy it. Listen, nothing, nothing my brother could do would affect my father's love for him. My dad loved him. Some of you tonight have adult children that are wayward. They're not living the way that you brought them up or the path that you, you, would, you would pray they'd go down for God. But it doesn't mean you don't love them just as much as the children you have that are living for God. But you sure do have a different relationship with those children. 
You don't have the relationship with that wayward one that you wish you could. And if you're not, listen, if you're not obeying God and you're not walking in the light, verse 7 of 1 John 1, but if we walk in the light, you know what light is? If darkness is a lack of any spiritual direction, light is walking in with spiritual direction. With direction from God. And if I walk in that light, take repeated steps in the spiritual direction God gives me, then I have fellowship one with another. Then I'm brought into that fellowship with God that I desire and that He desires. And it's the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, that cleanses us from all sin. So God says, I, He created us to obey Him. If you love Me, Jesus said, do what? Keep My commandments. He said, if you, why do you call Me Lord, Lord, and do not the things that I say? See, He can't be what He'd like to be to them if you're not walking in the light. So, how we live our loves, life does affect our relationship with God. Alright, number two. Let me give you line number two. And this is what society has said, and it comes from Satan as well. Well, there is no right or wrong. There is no right or wrong. There's, they will tell you, society likes to tell you, there's no absolute truth. But it sounds to me like that's an absolute truth. <laughs> now you're absolute about the truth the fact that there's no absolute truth. But look at 1 John 1 and verse 8. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Remember what Jesus said, I am the way, the truth and the life. So he's saying if we if we have no sin, in other words, <clears throat> when there's no right and there's no wrong, where does sin come in? Then we don't want to, you can't tell anyone that they're doing wrong or what they're doing is sinful because you hear the words back to you, don't judge me. And so we back off and say, well, okay, okay, I can't. It's, if you're doing it, I can't tell you you're wrong. And, and if I'm doing something, you can't tell me I'm wrong. So what we're saying is, nobody's, nobody does anything wrong. And if I say that I don't do anything wrong, that I don't have any sin, then the Bible says, I'm deceiving myself, and the truth, Jesus Christ, is not in me. If you have Jesus Christ living in you this evening, I'll guarantee you one thing. You know you are a sinner. I... I, I I'm, I'm, I'm very aware every day that I fall short of the glory of God. Because Christ lives in me. The truth is in me. You know, culture continues to change. We're seeing that right before our very eyes. I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's amazing the things that people are now getting... I mean, losing their career, losing their entire reputation, everything. In many cases, some things that happened 30 years ago. That's tragic. You understand that some of you weren't alive, you know, 30 years ago or 35 years ago, but you understand, it was a, culturally, we were at a different place then. Very different. Think about, hey, think about it just, not, not just morally or. Uh, between the genders, male and female, but think about it racially. Go back 50 years. Go back 60 years to the 1950s, 1960s, when they had they had separate restroom facilities for black and white in America. We have we don't the culture now has changed and and. Now it's not that way. Now you just say anything that might be racially insensitive and buddy, you're done. You're done. And I think that, and, and I'm not saying that's wrong. What about, what about air, you know, think about airplanes, restaurants. How many of you remember going in a restaurant and they'd say smoking or non-smoking? Huh? What happened? Finally society said, no, that, we determined that's not, that's not right. So now should I go back 
that say 30 years ago I was in your restaurant and I inhaled secondhand smoke, now I need to sue you. That's about how foolish some of it is. But it changes. Culture changes <clears throat> in just 30 years. And their truth changes with it. You didn't hear 30, 30 years ago, and, and, and surely 40 and 50 years ago, you never, you never heard about homosexuality. That was hush. That was kept quiet. That's why the term, that's where the term, what do you think the term, they, I came out of the closet? Where was it then all those years? In the closet. It was hidden. People kept it secret. They, they knew it was right, and society didn't accept it. Now, it's talked about, it's flaunted, it's on most television programs, and if you dare to speak your opinion against it, you're shut down. You can lose your career and have your life in shambles. Tolerance is what society says. You have to be tolerant. But even the definition of tolerance changes. Tolerance it used to mean you accept that different people have different views, some which are wrong. But you can't, you can't have that definition anymore. You have to agree that everybody's view is right. And you can't, can't ever say it. If you don't believe all views are true, then you're labeled intolerant. If I believe I'm right on a certain matter, and I believe there's absolute truth on a certain matter, and I confront you with that absolute truth, then I'm intolerant. I don't accept your view. But it's funny, when they believe they're right, then they don't want to be tolerant of my view. Then they become very intolerant. I just happened to see watching the basketball game the other night, <clears throat> a preview for some show. It caught my attention because the name of the show was Living Biblically. And I'll guarantee, I, I have no idea what it's about, but I, if it's Hollywood, they're poking fun at people who want to live by the Bible. Can you imagine what would happen in this country if somebody produced a show said, living by the Koran and poked fun at Muslims? Oh, there'd be an outrage. That would be pulled from the air immediately. It seems like everybody has to be tolerant except Christians. Then, then we can't be, you know, we're, we're, in, we're the intolerant ones. Jesus said, that all the, the murderers, the adulteries, the thefts, the evil thoughts, all that comes from our heart. The principle in our you is all sin has its origin in our heart. And if man's left to himself in his natural state, he will produce all kinds of wickedness. And we're seeing that happen. See, the belief of the world, they say basically people are good at heart. That's not true. The Bible says the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? They mention this woman who got married to a serial killer. Murderer. Murderer comes from our heart. That capability is in your heart tonight too. Oh, Pastor, I could never do that. Oh, yeah, you could. You got a wicked heart just like everybody else here. You got that natural heart. It's, it's, it's desperately wicked. And it's deceitful above all things. It's more deceitful than Satan himself. Your own heart. So when the world says their their favorite one of their favorite slogans is just follow your heart. Oh, that's one of the worst things you could do. It can deceive you. 
I won't raise your hand, but I think everybody would raise their hand and say, yeah, my heart's deceived me a few times. Thinking I was doing the right thing and it was the wrong thing to do. The wickedness of man, according to society, is attributed to bad examples, bad company, uh, peculiar temptations, or even the devil himself. But what we understand as believers who believe in the absolute truth of the Bible is we know that there's a fountain of wickedness that is in every one of our hearts. And if that heart is not made new by Jesus Christ and placed under His control, we're capable of any wickedness that you could think of. You don't need any bad company to teach you. You don't need any devil to tempt you in order for you to sin. We have within us the beginning of every sin under heaven. The Bible says there's things that are right and there's things that are wrong. There's things that God says right. And by the way, there's things that are good and there's things that are evil. God has set that up in His Word. And we follow what His Word says. Well, I, number one was how we live our lives will not affect our relationship with God. Number two, there's no right from wrong. Number three, here's another lie. Some claim to be Christians, but their lifestyle will show otherwise. Wow. 1 John 2, verse number 4. He that saith, I know him. Who's him? Jesus. And keepeth not his commandments. What's the next three words, church? What is it, church? Is a liar. And here it is again. And the truth is not in him. That's, that's pretty rough right there. You know, John was the last of the twelve apostles. All of them suffered martyrdom. They tried to kill John. They from history tells us they threw him in a cauldron of boiling oil and he didn't die. And the only reason he figured he didn't die is God had a plan for him. They pulled him out of there and they exiled him to an island of Patmos so he'd die out there all by himself. Well, it was when he was exiled to Patmos that God gave him the revelation of Jesus Christ. And he wrote the book of Revelation. God, I'm sure, kept him alive for that purpose. But he's the last surviving disciple. He's writing to second and third generation Christians. An old man writing to young people. That's John. William Barclay said, by A.D. 100, Christianity had become a thing of habit, traditional, half-hearted, nominal. John was writing when the thrill was gone and the flame of devotion had died to a flicker. And we have to guard that when we're a second and third and fourth generation Christian as well. If we're not careful, our faith and our Christianity turns into nothing more than a habit. It's just what we do. Prayers become powerless, Bible reading becomes stale, and our fellowship is insincere. Christianity the Bible teaches, is a way of life. Don't, don't, what he's saying here, I think if you understand this, he that saith I know him, and keepeth not his commandments, is a liar. Well, no, I don't go to church. No, I've read my Bible in months, maybe years. I don't think I ever pray unless I'm in trouble. I really don't care to be around Christians. Yeah, I drink a little bit and I smoke. But you know what? I, I prayed. I, I said a prayer back yonder that said, "Ask Jesus be my Savior, so I'm okay. John said, John said, 
You're a liar. Wow. It's pretty, pretty sobering stuff. Look at verse 3. Hereby we do know that we know Him. How do you know that you know Jesus? If we keep His commandments. I want to obey Him. I want to do what God wants. That desire doesn't come from the flesh. That desire has to come from God. Verse 5. Whoso keepeth his word, in him verily is the love of God perfected. Hereby know we that we are in him. So verse 6 concludes, He that saith he abideth in him, ought himself also so to walk, even as he walked. Years ago in college, we had a president of college who said, your walk talks and your talk talks, but your walk talks louder than your talk talks. You got that? Yeah. Your walk talks and your talk talks, but your walk talks louder than your talk talks. We know from Matthew 7, not everybody who says they're saved. Who and everybody who says they know the Lord knows the Lord. I wouldn't want my Christianity to be based on nothing with how I'm living now, nothing on my faith in Christ now, only that I did something back yonder. That, that, that type testimony is foreign to the Bible. John is letting these people know you're just going through the motions because this is what you've known for your, your dad and your grandpa and everybody right down the line. This is just doing whatever they did. He said, you better know that you're keeping His commandments. You better know that you are in Him. A grouchy old deacon was teaching Sunday school class. And he wanted to help the children understand what a, deacon, what, what a Christian was. So he said, why do people call me a Christian? There was just silence in the room when finally one of the boys said, well, maybe it's because they don't know you. <laughs> Uh-oh. People, people should not be surprised when you tell them I'm a Christian. They shouldn't look shocked. If, if, if the pastor showed up where you work, they shouldn't look at you and say, you go to church. Shouldn't be a surprise. How we live our lives will not affect our relationship with God. There's no right from wrong. Line number three, some claim to be Christians, but their lifestyle will show otherwise. Now, if you're a Christian, your lifestyle will show it. Number four, Jesus was a great man, maybe even a prophet, but he was not the Christ. First John one or first John two and verse twenty two. First John two verse twenty two. Do you see it? Who is a liar? But he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ. He is Antichrist that denieth the Father and the Son. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. Jesus Christ is God. The Word, Jesus, was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld His glories of the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. He is God. Christ is not a name. Christ is His title. Christ means anointed one. He's the chosen one of God to atone for our sin. So he is, he is more than a man. He is the one who atones for our sins. And He is, not the, one, he is the only one who can atone for our sins. Because He lived a perfect sinless life. Jesus, or In the Old Testament, when Moses asked God, who am I going to say sent me? What did God say should, that Moses should tell them? I am has sent me to you. 
And so they knew God of the Old Testament as the great I Am. So when Jesus looks at them and says, I am the way, and I am the truth, and I am the life, what is Jesus telling them? Yeah, I'm God. They wanted to kill Him because He made Himself equal with God. He could do that because He was. He's God. A Jewish soldier was attending services where he heard much about the character and the teaching of the Lord Jesus. He left and went to his rabbi and he said, Rabbi, the Christians say that the Christ has already come and yet we claim He is yet to come. Yes, assented the rabbi. Well, asked the young soldier, when our Christ comes, what will He have on Jesus Christ? And the rabbi did not know what to say. What is, what is the one we're waiting for? How is He going to be better? How is He going to be different? How is He going to have something that this Christ didn't have? And there's no answer to that. Because He is the Messiah. He's exactly who He said He was. He is God. It's that name that separates. It's that name that they persecute Christians about. It's not you, it's not you saying God. It's when you bring Jesus in the conversation that divides everything. Let me move on to number five tonight. Number five, Christians are hypocrites who show a lack of compassion Sometimes even a hatred for others. Even other Christians. Look at 1 John chapter 4. <clears throat> we know verse 19, do we not? 1 John four nineteen. We love Him. Why? Because He first loved us. If a man say, I love God and hate his brother, he is a liar. For he that loveth not his brother whom he hath seen, how can he love God whom he hath not seen? You see, Look at 1 John chapter 3, verse 11. 1 John 3, verse 11. This is the message that ye heard from the beginning, that ye should, what? Love one another. Verse 14. We know that we have passed from death unto life. In other words, I know that I'm saved. I know that I have eternal life. I'm passed from death unto life because we love the brethren. He that loveth not his brother abideth in death. Swear to love each other. Doesn't mean you don't understand. We've gone over this before. Love isn't just having warm fuzzies for somebody. I was talking to somebody tonight, I think in our 530 class with Leland, I was talking to him and, you know, he said, well, people say it was love at first sight. We just fell in love. That's not... That's not the Bible kind of love. You, most time when that happens, you fell in lust. That's what happened. And you know what happens? You fall out of lust just as quick. That's why people say, oh, we fell in love. And two years later, they're saying, I can't stand him. I can't stand her. I just don't love them anymore. And what you're saying is, I don't have the same feelings for him anymore. But love, I'm not saying love is absent of feeling, but love is the willing, sacrificial giving of yourself for the benefit of someone else with no thought of return. Willingly, sacrificially giving myself for the benefit of somebody else and not expecting anything back. God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. 
He gave us what we needed. God didn't just so love that He got warm fuzzies for us. God gave us what we needed to have. We needed a Savior. By this shall all men know you're my disciples, Jesus said, if ye have love one to another. That's love. It's sad that society, I think sometimes this one, this fifth one, it hurts to say, I think it has some truth to it. Because there's times we're hypocrites. And by the way, whenever somebody says there's hypocrites in the church, I'll agree with them. There's hypocrites everywhere else you go to. You still go there. Don't let, you know, I, hey, I'm, I'm nobody, if you're looking for a perfect church, keep moving. This one ain't it. Okay? We're all sinners. But we love one another. That's what Jesus said would be the distinguishing mark. It was one of the most extraordinary birthday parties ever held. It wasn't in a plush ballroom of a grand hotel. There weren't any famous celebrities there, no one powerful or rich. In fact, it was held at 3 a.m. in a small cafe in Honolulu, Hawaii. And the guest of honor was a prostitute. The fellow guests were prostitutes and the man who threw the party was a Christian minister. The idea came to the minister very early one morning as he sat in that cafe drinking coffee at the counter and a group of the prostitutes walked in and took up the stools around him. One of the girls, Agnes, lamented the fact that not only was it her birthday tomorrow but that she'd never had a birthday party. The minister thought it would be a great idea to surprise Agnes with a birthday party. He learned from the cafe owner, a guy named Harry, that those girls came in every morning about 3.30 a.m. And he agreed that he would set the place up for a party. But word got out onto the street. And by 3.15 the next morning, the place was packed. The cafe owner and his wife and the preacher. When Agnes walked in, she saw streamers, balloons, Harry holding a birthday cake and everyone screaming out, Happy birthday! Agnes was overwhelmed. Tears poured down her face as they sang happy birthday to her. Harry called on her to cut the cake and she paused because... She'd never had a birthday cake before. And she asked him, could I take it home to show my mom? When Agnes left, there was a stunned silence. The minister did what any preacher should do. He led Harry and Harry's wife in the room full there of prostitutes and others in a prayer for Agnes. It's a birthday party rarely seen. Thrown by a Christian minister for a 39-year-old prostitute who'd never had anyone go out of their way to do something like this and who expected nothing in return. In fact, it was so surprising that the cafe owner found it hard to believe that there'd be churches that would do this sort of thing. And he said, if there were, then that's the kind of church he'd like to go to. You see, by this shall all men know you're my disciples, because you have love one for another. Because you go out of your way to help somebody. John 8 and verse 44, you don't have to turn there, but Jesus said that the devil is the father of lies. He's a liar. How many times did you read in 1 John tonight, is a liar, is a liar, 
is a liar. That comes from Satan. He's a liar. And he's the father of lies. Jesus said he is the truth. And Jesus has a father. He's God. So God is the father of truth. Satan is the father of lies. One last verse I want you to turn to in the Gospel of John chapter 8. And we'll close here tonight. John 8. John 8, verse 31. Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on Him, If ye continue in My word, then are ye My disciples indeed. And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. The source of freedom the source of victory over sin, not just the penalty of sin, but the power of sin, is Jesus Christ. Truth. He is the truth. Let's pray together, shall we? Father, I pray you'll take the truth now this evening. Thank you, Lord, for Jesus being the truth. Lord, do not allow us to be conformed to the lies of the world. We're thankful that we have an absolute. We have the truth of Jesus. We have the truth of Your Word. And I pray, Lord, that we would realize we don't follow the cultural standards of what our culture says is right or wrong. We follow Jesus Christ who's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And Lord, I pray tonight you'd help each individual to know the truth. That each of us with Paul would say that I may know him. I don't want to just know about the truth. I just don't want to know about Jesus. I want to know Jesus. I want him to know me. And I pray that would be the, the passion and the desire of every believer here tonight.